create an unforgettable client experience using technology with Hainan Landa, episode 93. Are you ready to make your law firm a profit generating machine that will free up your time and skyrocket your impact? With more than two decades of business growth experience and having proven that you can be successful while prioritizing your family and your impact, introducing the Profit With Law podcast. I am your host, the creator of the firm differentiator 10X Effect, Moshe Amsel. Welcome to the Profit With Law podcast. I'm your host, Moshe Amsel, and today we have another stellar interview coming your way. My guest today is Hainan Landa. He's the CEO and founder of Optimal Networks. Now, why do I have an IT guy coming here on the show? Uh, Well, folks, IT technology is a linchpin in your law firm. It is an integral part of your law firm. And if you haven't recognized that yet, you're going to begin to recognize that through this conversation as well as through where the industry is going. I mean, just look at what's going on today with the virtualization of law firms, not by their own choice, but because of the reality of social distancing and the way that we're needing to lead our lives day to day in the current environment. It's just bringing us to the, the reality of the situation that Law firms have ignored technology, kind of like the United States has ignored public health uh, over the last 20 years, and we're paying for that right now. So it now is the perfect time to be having a conversation around technology, where it fits into your firm, um, and how can you embrace it in a way that's going to propel you and move you forward and bring you up to snuff with what's available out there in the marketplace or maybe even what's not available so you can start to identify that there's a need for that. So I'm really excited about having an IT conversation, having a technology conversation with Hainan, who is in the, a front runner in this business working with law firms day in, day out to uh, manage their IT and, and champion and pioneer their IT. Hainan is also author of a book. I'm going to let him talk about that when we, when we speak with him. But let me just tell you a little bit about him. He's not your average IT guy. Hainan Landa is the go-to resource for law firms who want to take their technology to the next level. As CEO of Optimal Network, Works based in the Washington, D.C. area. Hainan has been providing managed IT services and white glove support to law firms since 1991. After earning his BS and MS in electrical engineering and computer science from Johns Hopkins University, good school, Hainan went on to receive his MBA from the Wharton School of Business and has since built a successful company that does things differently. Hainan Landa is a trusted leader in the legal technology and business spaces and is passionate about educating law firms of all sizes and how to effectively leverage technology in a modern world. Hey, Nan, welcome to the show. Well, thank you very much, Moshe. I'm, I'm actually really pleased to be here and slightly blushing at that um, very nicely read uh, introduction. <laughs> <laughs> Who my wrote mother, it? My mother is very happy that I went to those good schools, so that's important. <laughs> There you go. But we all know that school is really just one piece of the puzzle. As a matter of fact, it's a really small piece of the puzzle uh, because real experiences happen in the real world and not in the school. So you have that to, to hang on the wall. But the reality is, is that you've yeah. been doing this since 1991. So you, you're a seasoned expert in this industry. And that's the real reason we're having this conversation today. Yeah, thank you. And listen, everything you said up front was just uh, so, so spot on in um in the sense of where law firms have been with technology and <clears throat> i think that's uh and i'm really pleased to be here i'm really pleased to be talking to you and to your audience because this book that i wrote is really just a call to action i mean it gives you some really good tools and framework and we could talk about that but um it's a call to action because technology is moving so quickly these days and when i say quickly you know i never thought i'd be sitting here with the the coronavirus, with everyone learning what exponential growth means as a solid day-by-day demonstration of how many people get infected um, and comparing that to technology, because I thought that half of what I'd be doing with my book is explaining to folks that this is not, technology is not growing in a linear fashion. It's not advancing in a linear fashion. It's advancing in an exponential fashion. And so if you look back, 
20 years ago um, and you say, hey, what was I doing in my office, right? How was I, you know, how was I getting my, how, are I, how was I getting my files? How was I communicating with people? I mean, you remember in 19, what was it, 1995 or something that there was barely email or was it 2005? Email was just coming, right? <laughs> 95, I think in 2005, <laughs> everyone knew what email was. <laughs> Um, and, uh, you know, and now it's, it's a fact of life and we get too much of it and it's, and we're trying to figure out ways to get around it. Right. And so what we've seen in the past for technology is nothing like what we're going to see in the future. And so my hope is, is that with this law firms get a chance to lean into the process a little bit rather than kind of try to contain it. Yeah, absolutely. And so, hey, on before we jump into the yeah. meat and potatoes of what we're going to talk about, I'd love it if you just took a, a minute or two to share with our audience a little bit about your journey. We, we gave you the, the pre-written recording at the beginning, but, you know, people want to know you as a person. So take us through that journey. Get started in I. How did you get started working for law? How did that all come about? Uh, you know, having law firms as your as your clients, and what the experience been like? Um, well, it's interesting. I, you know, you come out of uh, of school. I came out actually fairly young, I guess, with my degrees at age uh, twenty five, and said, "Hey, I'm going to start a business." And my parents um, also had their own business, so I I begged my mom for an office like a room inside her office, right? An office inside their office space. And she gave it to me and I printed out a banner that said Optimal Networks and I stuck it up on the wall, you know, for those dot matrix printers. <laughs> yeah. and, I, and I stuck it up on the wall and said, okay, I'm an IT company, let's, let's go. <laughs> I, had a, I had a business plan and everything, but um, <clears throat> honestly, you get out there in the, in the real world as we called it back then, right? And, um, and you find that you really have to provide service and you have to provide something valuable and tangible. And in the DC metro area, which is where we're located, is a, just a, um, a huge hub of many, 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 many law firms. And so I naturally began working with them and, and really enjoyed it, you know, and I'll, I'll tell you why. The, the one thing I, I love about law firms is they really understand what it is when they receive good service because lawyers are providing service as well and they're providing service to their clients and so if i i guess my i felt that if i could deliver the good service that they're looking for um then it could be a real positive mutual sort of relationship and that was pretty much my mantra from from uh, the get-go and so wow i mean almost 30 years has gone by and my business has gone through iteration after iteration after iteration but um from the very beginning we have had a real strong focus on culture um and on having people in my company who are uh, who have honesty and integrity and and um you know want to do the right thing and make sure that everyone benefits and uh that has put together and also want to have some fun which is sort of an interesting maybe for an IT firm, but, um, and then try to use that to combine some, some business intelligence for the law firm community and technology and uh, make something positive. So far, so good, cross your fingers and, and keep doing it. Does that help a little bit or, or you want more? <laughs> What's interesting is, is that there's a lot of parallels to your beginning story and mine. So I don't know if you know this about me, but I spent 20 years in the IT industry. And actually, you do know this about me because we had a preliminary conversation, but I'm reminding you now. But what's interesting is, is that how did I get into IT is completely my mother's fault. And I was a teenager. I was 17 years old and, uh, you know, doing what 17 year olds do and hanging out with friends till three in the morning and then sleep until one in the afternoon. And my mother said, you know, this is not the life I want for you. And she knew that I was good with tech. I, you know, there, there was some history there. Uh, my father was always, uh, he was one of these um, uh, business owners who was going from business to business, always with his next idea. One of the the things that he did was he helped bring an Israeli software company to the U.S. So mm -hmm. there was uh, tech support that had to happen at night. So when I was in, in high school, uh, and it was really people who just couldn't figure out how to move a mouse and touch a keyboard to you know figure out how to how to use the software. Uh, so I would do tech support at night, 
when I was in high school uh, and I really enjoyed it. So she knew that I had this knack for technology. She went to a local computer company, uh, like, I don't even want to call it a company. It was a little store that, you know, back then assembling computers was like a big business, you know, the, the, a computer costs two and a half thousand dollars. So if you can assemble it from parts at, you know, that cost you 700 bucks and then you, you sell it for two and a half thousand dollars that, you know, is a good, uh, a good business to be in. And she got me an a apprenticeship in this store. To, and basically that launched my, my IT career. The person said, you know, as soon as I can start sending you to clients and billing for your work, I'm going to start paying you. And within a few weeks, that was the case. And I was, I, you know, I had a job. I was earning $200 a week cash. And, you know, that was how I got started in the IT industry, which then ended up with me, you know, culminating in, in me being director of IT for a company uh, for many years and, and a top level project manager for many years. So I owe that to my mother. Now, obviously, I've taken a turn in what I'm doing and, and uh, career switch into accounting and then uh, business advisory services and now helping law firm owners. But that, those early days, very, very similar, <laughs> similar stories there, the, the little humble beginnings that we had. So uh, I, I resonated with, you know, with the story that you just told. Um, so, all right, you're now running a respectable IT company. Your target market is law firms. You're working with law firms every single day. You wrote a book. What's the name of the book again? Called The Modern Law Firm. The Modern Law Firm. Is it available on Amazon? Uh, it is launching this week, so you can okay. you can pre-order it today, and uh, on April sixteenth, it's uh, it's out in the marketplace. So, folks, we're recording this on April fourteenth. Uh, more than likely, this episode is getting released on. Uh, let's see, today is Tuesday, so. 15th, 16th, the 23rd is most likely when this episode is going to come out. So the book should be available. We're going to link to that in the show notes. So definitely take a look down there. You click the link and go and buy the book. And uh, I'm sure that Hainan did an amazing job writing that book. So I'm looking forward to reading it myself. But you wrote a book for law firms, right? So that you're obviously deeply entrenched in the space. What are you seeing as the the issues when it comes to the legal industry and the adoption of technology? Um, so, you know, I see it across the board, right? I, I think that we've come to a place where most law firms are, are um, they recognize that technology is important, important, but they haven't necessarily gotten to the, um, to the level that, it, that they're not looking at it as a cost center. Right, so you, got, you have some law firms that are looking at it as, oh my God, I gotta keep spending for this technology. It's driving me insane. How long can we stretch out this machinery, right? How long can we, can we make it last so we don't have to keep paying for, the, for, the, for new machines, for upgrades, for all this stuff that we pay for? It's expensive. And then you have a category of law firms who, there's, there's not that many of them, but they're, they're becoming more and more prevalent that are saying, oh my God, if we can take this technology and use it efficiently and effectively, then this can actually improve our clients' experience with us. We can attract more clients, we can retain more clients, we can um, you know, really push our firm forward, we can grow the firm, we can attract better talent. And those are, those are the ones that are really thriving and succeeding out there too. And I think they're the ones that have the right attitude. And so what I, what I tried to do in my book was actually look at those companies and say, all right, what are the, what are the traits that those companies, that those um, law firms are exhibiting and how do we, how do we get there? Like, uh, so one of the things in my book is really like a benchmarking tool. It's uh, your technology operational maturity level. You have to give it a, a fancy name. And, um, <laughs> and it goes through like 14 different um, elements of technology and technology management and governance. And, um, you know, you get to see like a full 360 view of your firm and how it's handling itself in technology. And the way you do it, it's real simple, is for each one of those traits, it, you can see what a high functioning law firm looks like. And you get to see, are you doing that? Yes, no, some of it. Right, and you start scoring yourself, and so you start creating a benchmark of 
how to where you are now and where you want to go. Yeah. Now, one of the things that um, people are going to be saying, they're listening to this and they're going to be saying, well, I'm not there yet. Like, uh, you know, when I have this, then I can focus on technology. Hmm. When is the right time for a law firm owner to focus on technology, to make it a, a front running effort in the firm? Uh, what I'm going to say it's immediately like you can't, you cannot, I mean, look, you have to make money. Okay. I get that. Right. So you, and that's more your, your area than my area. <laughs> um, Fair enough. Yeah. But um, so you have to make money, but once there's, once there's money, technology is just, it's too important. Let's let, look, take a look at what's happening right this minute, right now. Okay. You, you have a certain number of firms who have invested heavily in technology and I'm talking uh, so one of the services we offer is a, is a cloud service, it's like virtual desktop. So wherever you go, mm -hmm. you can download a Windows desktop and start working just like as if you were in the office. About 35% of my clients were on this service. Um, they, they valued the mobility, right? They, mm -hmm. they were happy to be sitting in a car going up I-95 at 70 miles an hour and working. Okay. <laughs> Not driving, passenger side. Um, and... Um, yeah, I do it driving, but don't tell anybody. <laughs> I'm not telling you. <laughs> um, and, and, you know, uh, these folks, when it was time to go virtual, uh, they went home and they kept working just like they have been for years. And the comments I got were really quite gratifying, you know, like, you know, that, that wasn't the hard part, right? That was nothing. And then you have firms who didn't make that a priority, didn't make mobility a priority, and they were suffering. Where do they get the equipment? Where do they get, you know, how are they gonna set up at home? How are they gonna get their files? How are they gonna record their time? How are they gonna review their invoices? How this, how this, how this, how this? And, and they, weren't, they weren't ready and, and prepped for this. And this is, it's such a stark contrast mm -hmm. how much change they had to go through to be able to work from home versus these other clients who already gave it a priority. And that's what I'm right. trying to get at. It's not just the mobility piece, but it's, it's overall. You just, you got to get ready for these technology changes. They're going to come at us faster and faster and faster. Absolutely. And so mobility is a, is a key point, but it, it's, it's highlighted with the current events. The reality is, is that if we were having this conversation six weeks ago, I don't know that we'd be talking about mobility as the, the, the most important component of legal tech. Uh, I think it's important, but I think that the the bigger the bigger issue is productivity, right, mm -hmm. and customer experience. So let's talk about that because I think that everyone knows. Okay, I needed to half-ass this virtual law firm and and just put pieces together to make it work. Okay. And maybe it's a perfect permanent solution too with whatever whatever you found. But let's just assume that we're past that. Okay, so they're working virtually. They're working from home. Where should they be focusing their, their attention when it comes to, to legal tech, where it's going to make a difference to the firm? It's gonna make a difference to the way that the firm handles the work that they're doing. It's going to make them more profitable. You know, people uh, are listening to this thinking, well, I, can't, I don't have the time or the money to invest in this. Mm -hmm. And my argument is, is that you don't have the time or the money not to, right? Um, because there's opportunity cost that's happening. There's, there's lost revenue, there's lost um, profit, there's, there's, there's expenses that are being incurred every single day that don't have to be incurred because technology could be doing the work. So let's talk about that. Um, where, do, where do you sit in that arena? What are some examples of where productivity um, has been boosted tremendously because of implementation of technology and what does that look like? Um. I love the one thing you said uh, that you can look at it from a client perspective, right? You can look at it from a client, your client experience. And if you can, uh, um, if you can actually take your, uh, take your firm and look at it from the point and your, and your work product and your, and your, ex and what you're doing and swivel it and look at it from the point of view of your client, Imagine how many improvements you could make if you could even meet your client halfway, right, as to the way they're working. And I'll give you one like really solid example. 
that um, actually it, my lawyer did, uh, my attorney did, which just stunned me. Um, m many firms have said the only way we communicate with clients is via email. And it's just, that's it. That's the only way because of security and because of this and because of that, because we need to track all the communications and whatever. There's, it's not that there's bad reasoning behind it. It's good reasoning. But for me as a, as a client, I'm, I'm using Slack with my 43 employees and mm -hmm. I'm, man, I'm moving, right? I like my communications are flowing left and right. We probably transmit 150,000 instant messages over Slack and collaborate right. on projects and we're moving at light speed. And then I get an email from my attorney and I'm like, Oh, wait, hold on. Let me, uh, let me switch gears. Let me look at this document. Let me review the contract. Let me, let me slow down. Let me send them messages by commenting on a PDF and then attaching it to the email. Have I bored you yet? Like in my mind, I'm already bored, right? And <laughs> <laughs> well, because some people are listening to this and they're, they're like, well, there's a better way to do that. Right. So, <clears throat> so my attorney says that one of his clients is also using Slack, right? And this is Slack. We'll talk about it. It's one of the uh, more popular uh, kind of um, collaboration tools out there, Slack and Microsoft Teams, a lot of people are talking about, are probably mm -hmm. the tops uh, for internal communication. And what he did was he, he has a, a small firm and he said, I can do this. My client is using Slack. I will also use Slack to communicate with my client. <clears throat> and he jumped into um, their, uh, their Slack environment and he was able to move at the speed of the client. Right mm -hmm. now there are security considerations and I'm not trying to minimize those and we can spend another three hours talking about security. Right, right. But, but, but what he did was he, uh, he met the client halfway. He went closer to the client in the way they communicate and tried to fit what he was doing from a law point of view, which is business law, into, right. their, into their workflow. Brilliant. Now I'm a client, I'm working on my legal stuff as effectively as I'm working on everything else in my operation. Imagine mm -hmm. how much more proactive I can be. Imagine how much more attention I can give as a client to my legal documents that need to be done rather than having them sit and languish in an email for, you know, until I get back to my inbox, which is already overflowing. Right. So yep. that's, I don't know. That's, that's, one area that that we could talk about um it's sort of advanced to be honest with you i, I would i think you have to see where where you are so if if i'm just a few people in a in a law firm and i am um, working with something like dropbox or sharepoint or onedrive i mean or something one of those uh, uh file sharing uh packages and i'm having trouble hunting down my latest files you know my latest documents and i don't know which version is which and i don't know who's worked on it last and i don't even know where it's filed well the first thing out of the box i would look at is a document management system and there's good ones out there and now they all offer cloud versions like if you go to net documents um net documents has a, a wonderful cloud they've been cloud since way before cloud was even called cloud and they're very very secure and all of a sudden with a little bit of investment each month you have a place to store your documents you can categorize your documents you can um you know which version you're on you know which client is for you know who's worked on it you can pass around the documents inside your your firm and that already takes you up six notches from where you were so you know every everyone needs to take their levels and and move up one step. <laughs> yeah, I, I actually believe that we have slated um, on the podcast here to interview. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure if it's the CEO or somebody else in the company, but somebody from Net Documents is Phenomenal. on the roster to be interviewed here. So uh, we'll definitely dive deep into that with okay. you know with him. But um, you bring up a, a really good point, which is we don't know where people are sitting right now. I mean, I know that I met with a um, New York City uh, law firm doing two, three million dollars in revenue, mm -hmm. and the, they're operating on paper. 
like they're literally handwriting invoices to clients and sending it out. Like the, you know, they're, I guess they have computers in the office for, for research or whatever, but the zero adoption of technology when it comes to the operations of the office, I can't imagine what they had to do or, or aren't doing to operate currently in this environment. Um, but there's, there's all the whole gamut out there of people and, and what they do. People are listening to you talking about marking up a PDF and thinking, I didn't know you could do that. <laughs> so, you know, and, and that's like the old way to do it. There's, n there's new and better ways to do it. So um, it, it almost feels like it's a dizzying speed that this, that changes are happening and, and being implemented in the, in the marketplace that it feels like there, you need to, it's, it's almost like a full-time job to stay on top of it and to stay, you know, stay up to snuff with what is even available, let alone what to, uh, what to implement. And I, I'm closely tied to uh, Melanie Leonard. I don't know if you've heard of her. Melanie Leonard has a, a, an operation called Streamline Legal. Uh, she helps solo and smalls uh, with implementation of technology. So she's a champion of Clio for practice management and a, a number of other pieces of tech where she can help you with those pieces and implementing that. Um, but I feel like you're, you're talking about systematically having processes in place that are going to make your life easier. I mean, document management is, is one example. We can come up with a lot of examples, but right. what underlying what we're looking at is what are you doing day to day? Like what are your activities that, that you're busy with? And let's look at that and see if we can cut some of that out. If you're spending time hunting for a document, trying to figure out which is the right one, then your system for organizing that information is not good because your time is very, very precious. And every time that you are wasting time looking for a communication, looking for uh, a document, um, trying to find a template you've created to, to create something, all of those things are, are, are making you less profitable because they're robbing you of other opportunities that you could be using that time for. And I think that that's, you know, that, that's really where we need to focus the attention. And I'd love for, if, if you can give us some, some ROI examples, like, you know, where implementation of certain pieces of technology in a firm have exponentially increased our capacity because of that adoption. Uh, because I think that that's really where the problem is. I think that the productivity piece and the client experience, we, you started mentioning that, that you know, we, we look at where the client's sitting and, and understand where they are and, and meeting them where they are. The client experience is huge because your clients are the ones that are going to carry your torch. They're going to you know, talk to other people about you. That's where goodwill in the marketplace is going to carry your firm. It's going to you know, uh, continue to bring in that stream of clients. But if you can't figure out how to profit off those clients coming in, what, what are you doing? Mm -hmm. So I think that there's two sides of this, of this conversation. There's the client experience is going to further enhance the inba inbound stream of clients that are coming in, but there's the profitability piece, which is, you know, yeah. what, what's Absolutely. the productivity? And, and I think there's one more side, uh, you know, if I could throw in like a, a third point on this triangle, of course. that technology also presents opportunities for, uh, for practice, uh, you know, for, uh, to, to focus in your practice and become like leading in certain areas, in certain modern areas of, of technology, like artificial intelligence and, um, and Bitcoin and blockchain and all these technologies that we are hearing about that are taking the world by storm. There are tons and tons of things that can be done on the legal side with these, you know, on a legal practice focused around artificial intelligence, for example. Right. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, you have the innovation piece of it also that it could actually spawn uh, a hugely profitable new part of your practice. It's interesting. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. And and I'm always I'm always looking for those opportunities, right? So you know, if even today, like one of the th one of the big messages that I'm trying to share with with um, the legal industry is to look at your client's journey and look at before they need you and look at after they're done with you for other opportunities where you can serve them in those areas. 
because yeah. that's where, you know, people that they're complaining. And I know that some law firms are busier than they've ever been right now, but there are other law firms that instantly business has, shri has shriveled up and there's nothing there. And they're, they're sitting there wondering like, what do I do? Do I need to introduce a new practice area? No, you need to look at your client and see where they are right now. What is their pain point? Like if you're a business attorney, even though you're not an accountant, Right now, your clients are wondering about how they're going to survive. Cash is on their mind. All they care about is how do I get the PPP? How do I get the EIDL? All right. that stuff that's going on. And the reality is, is that that PPP is not going to save their business. That EIDL is not going to save their business. It might help, but they might be wasting so much effort and so much energy on trying to get something that is not even there because the money is going to run out. The biggest player has got it already. What about focusing on another way to make money? What about focusing on another thing that you can introduce that is within your wheelhouse? It's not completely changing what you're doing and add that to the beginning of the process, to the end of the process. Have, have a new inventive way to get, to provide a service and get paid in a, in a different way, a smaller way, a bigger way, whatever it is, but before they would typically need you and introduce that into the marketplace so that you can now have something else that's bringing in revenue into your firm and you're serving the client earlier on, which is a natural transition for them to then move into the service area that you're providing. Um, so I love this idea of always thinking about new ways to innovate, to mm -hmm. introduce new, it's not a new practice area. It's a new way to serve your client. You got to look at your client and look at what they're, what they're doing, what they're struggling with. And if Bitcoin or artificial intelligence or, um, just helping them with with out of the box information services you know like we we sit we sit as law, as lawyers and think okay my job is to serve somebody and and charge them for my time no that i mean that model is a broken model uh you can get into the information business it's a huge industry and people look up to you as a knowledge knowledgeable source so why not charge for that information? Why not give a, a, a huge piece of what you're doing as education that's scalable, that's, you know, it, it's, it's much more affordable for a lot of people than the service you're offering and start to introduce that. So I love where that idea is and where it can go. I'd like to rope it back to the productivity. I think you're dodging dodging the question. I'm not. So. I'm not. <laughs> at all. Um, in fact, I've I've been uh, thinking about uh, what sort of ROI example uh, sort of works for this, and I, I don't know that I would like relate it to a, a specific um, package or specific software. Like any time that you are able to 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 bring in a intelligent, well done, well implemented um, software or cloud-based service to take over a process that is dragging you down. Um, mm -hmm. like, like this billing process, uh, have, you, have you seen these? Uh, uh, look, I'll tell you about this, but then I have another example for you. So, I'll, I'll, okay. um, so an old school billing example is that uh, you take all the, the time that the attorneys have recorded or maybe their secretaries have recorded for them and you print them out. This is a slightly larger law firm that I'm thinking about. Like, I don't know, I think they got 50, 60 people, but they, they print out all their uh, draft invoices. These invoices go back to all of the attorneys, the attorneys by pen, right? By Sharpie, mark up all the invoices. Those go back to the billing clerks. The billing cl clerks input all that data into the billing system. Then it all gets re uh, reprinted out for final approval to the law firm, then eventually somehow gets made into these huge PDFs that get split up and sent off to the clients for the invoices. This is what happens on a monthly basis. That is a process that yep. is heavily paper intensive, involves many back and forth with many different people, and is now very simply solved by these packages like Clio, like, like Practice Panther, Bill for Time, whatever. There's a million of them out there. And we, nobody has to do this anymore. The, the review process can happen online. It can all be quick. And you've saved yourself, I don't know how many hours of your own time and all the people helping you to get your invoices out. So the ROI is almost, I mean, I can't calculate it, but I'm sure they've got it up on their websites. Right. But, but take a look at it from maybe a, 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 a slightly different 
viewpoint of if you feel like you're dragging yourself through your technology on a day-to-day -day basis, if you feel like it's a hindrance, it probably is. Right. And the question then becomes why, right? Like where, why is my technology driving me insane? And why do I have to spend so much time? Why is my computer not turning on? Why is my thing, my screen freezing? Why can't I type without this thing just leaving me alone so I can focus on what I'm working on? And that, um, to put too fine a point on it, probably relates to who you're using for technology services. And it's, it's, uh, it's something you gotta look at. And I think that, um, Law firms that who want, want to lean in on technology a little bit need to understand who their partner is. Um, and this is not a plug. This is, I, I'm not trying to get business out of this, honestly. I'm, I'm literally just saying that there are, if you're trying to minimize costs in a law firm, you may look for a cheaper provider. And it's just like looking for a cheap lawyer. You don't want to do it. <laughs> you know, you, you want to, you want to raise your, you want to raise your sights up a little bit and make sure you find someone that really knows and understands what you're trying to do as an organization, as a firm, where you're trying to go, what your goals are. Do they understand you? And can they, can they deliver? And I would, I would look at that. It's, um, it's, I'm not sure it's a place that people, people look immediately. Uh, but it can it can make a big difference if you're using the right because you you know what you what triggered me on this was when you said it's a full time job, right? Oh yeah. If I've got a law firm of five people, I don't have time for a, a full time technology person. So it just depends so hard on that that company, that partner, that advisor that you're using for for your technology. So right. I would zero in on that if you're having trouble. Yeah, and I think that there's, so there, there's, there's two, um, there's, I think part of the, the problem there is that even in the IT industry, and I, I, I'm going to say you, and I'm not referring to you, you know, as your business, but you as a MSP managed services provider in the IT industry, generally MSPs, they want to operate your computer network. They want to operate your core suite of software, like your, where are you storing your files and, and what are you using for your day-to-day -day office applications. But when it comes to the actual software that a law firm needs to be concerned about, like your practice management software, your CRM, your calendaring software, and having all these talk to each other, typically MSPs are like, oh, we don't handle that. You know, like we, this, we, we stop at a certain point. And I think that the, the challenge for law firms is to find somebody that can provide those services. Uh, I, I mentioned Melanie Leonard at Streamline Legal, you know, that's what she does. Um, and, you know, maybe you need to have two providers, one that's providing your, your core um, technology services, they're gonna be providing your troubleshooting, your support of your applications, and then there's somebody who's providing the, the legal specific applications that you might need. Uh, but I wonder if the technology industry itself is missing the boat here and not realizing like, hey, you know, if you were able to step in and, and handle the full gamut for law firms, you can have such a more bigger, more significant impact on their operation and their efficiency and their experience and become a partner in that way so that you do provide and handle everything. And I know it's, a, I, I was in the MSP industry. I know what I'm, what I'm talking about is something that's very, very difficult to accommodate because there's so many pieces of software out there. You can't possibly become a champion in all of them. Uh, but I don't know what the right solution is. Maybe you do. Well, I, I don't, but I will tell you that I think you hit the nail on the head um, that from coming at it from the IT industry perspective, there's two things going on. First of all, um, the IT industry is fairly new, especially if you, if you compare it to law firms, right? Like what are we, 30 years old, maybe 35 total. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's mostly right now a self-taught industry. And I think it's, it's nowhere near its peak and, and it's nowhere near its maturity level and it's a little bit of the wild west out there, right? So uh, it's very hard to differentiate who's good, who's bad, and it also from the IT side, people don't really know yet what to focus on, right? We, we can look at Microsoft and we say, wow, they, 
they have some market share. Maybe we should focus on Microsoft, right? Right. So, so you're only now uh, starting to see IT companies uh, niche, right? Start coming, like getting a little bit more specific in the in the customer verticals that they serve, mm -hmm. and you're only now starting to see them hyper niche, meaning right. we will only serve one type of customer. Mm -hmm. One and when that. And I think that trend is going to continue because of exactly what you're saying, that they're going to need to be able to bring stronger, more targeted solutions in, into the market. Right. So you do see, yeah. you see a few on the, on the, um, uh, of the larger um, IT companies focusing in on say the legal market. But what that means is that they have a passing understanding of a lot of the, the, the applications that are in use by the, by the legal profession and right. maybe some depth in document management. Mm -hmm. See what I mean? Because right. there's only three document management companies out there that are, are worth anything. So they can actually say, all right, let me dedicate some resources to that. But right. So many practice management and billing and research and, estate planning and, uh, you know, all, all those millions of little applications out there. And that's very right. difficult to put your arms around you. And it's, and then there's two levels of it, right? One is to support it and, and to work with their tech support if there's an issue. And another one is to actually become an implementer and to really deliver value there. So it's a, right. it's a very tall mountain to climb for a managed services provider. So I, as it stands now, I like the what you just put out there. Maybe you need two two providers for those things, and right. those are usually individual consultants, and many of them are very very good. Yeah, yeah. So I, I think that that we need to we need to recognize that there's two things, right? There's the infrastructure piece, and the and there's the and there's the application piece, you know. And and without getting into the the OSI model and all of that stuff, but basically the application, the application that's forward facing that you're getting your hands on every day has a lot of customization that it can have. And if you don't want to be busy with that all the time, then it definitely behooves you to bring in a professional who knows the ins and outs of that application. They've been working with it for a, a myriad of clients and, and they know the, the use case scenarios that you haven't thought of. And they can help you implement it in that way. And today with, you know, every application being released and produced to solve a specific problem, there's also dozens and dozens of applications that might make sense for your law firm. And it becomes very, very confusing to have this fragmented suite of IT that is each one has its purpose, but, you, you know, separate logins for each one. Um, each one is managed completely independently and the, there's no communication primarily, you know, mostly there's no communication between these applications. Um, one thing that's a big, a big thing today is, is Zapier, like this the middleware software that allows you to talk from one application to another. So at least if I close a deal in my CRM, it creates the, the contact and the basic information for that deal in my my practice management software right. uh, so there's you know that that exists and to know that it exists is important like you need to you need to understand that this is an option for you uh, to solve this problem but I think the real solution is maturity and I don't think that we're there yet I think that we have a long ways to go and as legal tech matures we're going to find that there's going to be broader solutions to the, the problems like practice management software is going to start having calendaring function, self calendaring function built into it. So you don't have to have Calendly or Acuity on top of your practice management software. You know, net documents is going to become integrated into your practice management software or whatever it is. I'm using that as an, your example, but you know, document management will become part of the practice management software. And until we have this application that you can get, yeah, that basically covers all your bases. I think that um, it's going to remain a big hurdle for for law firms. And I think this podcast interview is is if nothing else, it's creating awareness around the problem. But I don't think that we have the solutions, and I, I, it's frustrating 
um, you know, sitting here as somebody who's supporting, uh, you know, law firms. And I think that you probably feel the same way, you know, that we don't have better solutions. And, and there, there's a lot of good solutions out there, but there's a lot of room for improvement. Yeah, I mean, I think from a, a productivity point of view, there's there's always going to be room for improvement, and there's always going to be room for integration, and there's going to be room for smoothing it out. Um, but but it doesn't that doesn't release the law firms, right? It it doesn't release them from the burden of doing the best they can, right? Right. You have, you have to work with this, and you have to try to get ahead of it, and. It doesn't mean that it's going to be perfect, and it doesn't mean that you're not going to have some some glitches between your practice management software and and your document management software. So what? So we got to move, but we got to have those things, right? Because we can't we can't be backwards, and we have to stay on top of what's happening in the field, and we have to make sure we're getting those updates and we're applying them and saying, oh, wait a minute, Net Documents just released an integration. I managed just released an integration with something or uh, one of the other packages does this work you know um <laughs> it, it's very interesting to see like even simple things like i manage and um net documents have a feature that if you have filed an email in outlook into either net documents or i manage they will put a green check mark on that email for everyone who, who is on that email chain Mm -hmm. That's cool. That prevents every all six people on the email chain from filing it. Right. Brilliant, brilliant simple feature. If you're filing right. emails in that package, almost a necessity for the firms that use it. Right. Right. And so, um, so someone has to be on the lookout. Did was that feature introduced? Are other features being introduced that we could take advantage of and and put it in there? And so. Yeah, I think it's a partnership at this point. I think it's a partnership between the law firms and the IT firms and the um, the consulting, the consultants who get deeper into the productivity software and the productivity software manufacturers and their tech support and all that kind of stuff. So I'm not saying it's not a lot, but I, I am saying that we have to find a way to move, continue to move the mountain, right? And continue to, to make progress. Yeah. And something that you said triggered uh, this idea in, in my mind of, of a product champion, you know, that perhaps in your law firm, every time that you introduce a new piece of software, you select one or two people on your staff to be the product champion of that product. It's their job to stay on the lookout for new features, to evaluate whether it's something to bring to the to practice um, as, you know, hey, let's, let's investigate whether this makes sense for us or not, and basically keep their ear to the ground. I think that if you divvy it up that way and have different product champions for different products, then that's going to, well, first of all, it's going to elevate the technology prowess of the firm, right? So people are going to be more inclined to adopt technology, to learn technology when they've got stake in it. And, and they, you know, so they feel like they're part of the process, but it's also going to spread it across, you know, multiple uh, people and not make it, all rely on, on one person. You know, you as the owner of the firm should not be needing to stay on top of every single piece of software, should not be needing to stay on top of, you know, what's happening in legal tech. You should remain educated, but use your staff to educate you. Let them filter through it and come back to you with just the most important things that you need to hear. And that'll save you a ton of, of time and energy and frustration of needing to stay on top of all of that. Yeah, I think that's a brilliant idea. And I think, I think as the owner, you want to make the decision of which technology to put in place, right, in most cases, um, because otherwise it can get out of control. And that's one of the things that we've started seeing on the IT front is that the consumer level technology is so much more friendly and easy to use on your phones and your iPads and wherever you are, that people are walking into law firms and saying, wait a minute, I have to sit here? <laughs> why can't I roam, you know, or, or whatever? And they're saying, why isn't this as friendly as my iPhone? Um, and so they start wanting to bring in their own technology to work around your firm technology. And that's actually a, we call that, um, there's a name for it, it's called shadow IT. And they like almost develop a whole nother IT system outside of what you are trying to create in your organization. Um, so I do believe it's very important for you as the owner to decide what technology is in your firm and is being used by your firm. The idea of 
product champions, that's just brilliant. Because if you can get people internally to buy into that, they'll spread it around, they'll spread the love, and they'll continue to teach people how to, how to use it and put in the new features. And uh, I like that a lot, yes. Yeah, um, and, and this shadow IT problem, I, I wanna go, go back to that for just a second. Um, folks, that is opening you up to a whole nother realm of security issues, yes. um, support issues, you know, we're suddenly, hey, I'm using my cell phone to text my client because it's so much easier than doing it within the system. And now there's no trace of that information. It's not secure. And all of a sudden your users are calling up and say, hey, I need some, some help because my texts are not going out to my clients. You know, now you're needing to support a system that wasn't even something that's supposed to be part of your IT system. So I think that the way to, to solve that is to just have very firm policies in place from the get-go of what is and is not allowed. And, and, and staff needs to be educated that you must use our systems and not, go, and not circumvent them. And if there's a problem that something cannot be done, that's bring it to our attention. Like let us collaborate together and figure out how to solve it. Don't just take matters into your own hand and try to, you know, I, I could just imagine that, you know, people FaceTiming the clients because the client's got FaceTime, they've got FaceTime and, you know, um, there, there's no, there's no record of that. There's no, there's no way to track that. There's, you know, um, it becomes like you said, the wild, wild west. So, um, I love the fact that you have like a piece of IT experience because you're actually saying everything that I that I agree with. I'm not, I'm sitting here nodding furiously. I mean, so security and protecting your client information, and you know, my uh, my COO always says this. David always says this. Was the law firm is the last place in the world where people actually come and deposit their secrets. That data is so important. The trust your clients are placing in you is so important. And you really, you really have to pay attention to that. I, you couldn't have said it better. I just, I'm really I, I love that. I love that terminology. They deposit their secrets. Love it. Um, all right. So with that, we're going to, we're going to wrap this up. But uh, uh, Hainan, it was a pleasure having you here. I'd Thank like you. you to do two things before you leave. Number one, I'd like you to give one parting piece of advice or, or, or share one last thought with our listeners that, you know, if you had to just pick one thing to, to, to educate them on or, or share with them, that this is the thing that you're going to choose. And folks, it, it's going to, it, you know, it, it, whatever, whatever it is that Hainan chooses to share with you right now, it, this is like, you know, somebody with, uh, what is it, th almost 30 years of experience in the IT industry and serving law firms, <laughs> and this is what he chose to hang his hat on. So you, better, you better take it to heart and go with it. Um, but the second thing is, is I'd love you to just uh, plug your book one more time. And for those who are in your geographic area, you definitely can just share uh, quickly about how they can get in touch with you if they're interested in IT services from your, from your company in the DC metro area. But those, that's what I'd like you to just share with us before we go. Sure, okay. So let me start um, with giving you a nugget. Since this is gonna be aired, still we're gonna be in the thick of this coronavirus and we're gonna be thick in the working from home um, scenario, I would really urge everyone, this is very practical, very now, it's not, this is not theoretical. Get yourself educated on security, on, on secure, best pr practices for security on your home machines right now. If you are working at home, are, you got two issues going on that are really, that are really worrisome for me. One is that a lot of us have gone and are now working from our home machines instead of our firm machines, which we know are taken care of and patched and have antivirus and anti-spyware and everything that they need to be protected. The home machines, not so much. Also, a lot of people are sharing their home machines with, um, with their kids and their spouse. Try not to do that. <laughs> it's a whole different world and try to tighten up your network settings at home, you know, change your passwords on your routers and your Wi-Fi passwords. We have some big gaping security holes in the home work world at the same time that the scammers are having a field day. It is Christmas for the scammers right now because of the pandemic and they love to prey on fear. There was a 37% rise since February in 
uh, data breaches, there's a 600% rise in phishing scams right now. And most of them are related to the coronavirus CDC, uh, you know, pretending to be the CDC, pretending to be the World Health Organization, and trying to get you to release your credentials and to take over your machines. So educate yourself on this a little bit. Um, I will, I, in fact, let me just do this. I put out a, a resource page on our website for this. So it's um, optimalnetworks.com slash work from home. And there's another one, which is optimalnetworks.com slash security. There's a couple of webinars sitting there right at the top. They're half an hour. Listen to them. It's, it's it, just educate yourself on this. I'm, I'm worried about, about our move to, to working from home. So that's the, that's the nugget I will leave you with. Um, if you want me to plug, all right, I'll plug. Look, I have a bunch of them. The, the hard copies came in. Uh, it's so exciting. The book is called The Modern Law Firm, How to Thrive in an Era of Rapid Technological Change. Um, you can get it on Amazon. Uh, we're putting up a little book site called uh, modernlawfirmbook.com. You're welcome to go there and learn more about it. There's a bunch of uh, videos. Um, it's a, going to be available in every format under the sun. <clears throat> Kindle and audiobook and hardback and softback and so um, I, I'd love it if you guys pick it up and read it and um, it's actually the first week of the book I think we'll, we'll if you if you put this out people can actually get it for a, the Kindle version for a lot less if they want to gift it to people um, and then last I'm happy to entertain questions or emails from anyone uh, it does not have to be in our local area and any Happy to serve as a sounding board. Uh, my email is hlanda at optimalnetworks.com. Awesome. Hey, Nan, thank you so much. Folks, we're going to link all that up in the show notes so you don't have to remember anything. There'll be a link to the book. There'll be a link to the two uh, places on the Optimal Networks uh, website where you can get more information on security and working from home and uh, also uh, Hainan's email address. So feel free to flood his email box with emails. He's not reading it anyway. He's in his Slack channel. He didn't share that with us. So, <laughs> but no, I, I really appreciate the conversation that we had. And I think that we need to have more conversations like this. I think that um, legal tech, I mean, there are podcasts that focus entirely on legal tech and, and there's a lot of stuff that's happening. Big things like, uh, you know, Clio, you know, got $250 million in funding uh, recently. I think it was in January was the big news. Um, and to see big investment dollars going into a legal tech company is a sign of things to come. It's a sign of, you know, people are starting to pay attention to the possibility that there's, you know, there's real potential here. Um, so if investors are seeing potential, then you as a law firm owner need to recognize that. Um, I recently did a podcast on leadership. Part of leadership is being able to envision the future, it's being able to see what's coming. And you need to not only catch up to the current times, but you need to actually start getting involved in the future and, and, and having conversations with your software providers, you know, start telling them what things you'd like to see that they're not already doing uh, because they need the voice of the community. They need the feedback from you in order to know where the problems lie. And the more that you talk about it, the more likely that there is going to become solutions for those problems down the road. So uh, definitely technology is here to stay. It's here to make your life easier, better. It doesn't feel that way sometimes. I get it. But I definitely think that this is something that is really, really important um, for the law firm. I mean, even look at the, the incubator we run, which is for micro, micro law firms. You know, you're just starting out or you're, you know, you're on your journey to your first 250K annually in revenue. Um, and so it's just you. And in the incubator, um, we've we've created three areas that we're teaching on practice management, you know, the financials running your business is one of them. Marketing is another. And the third one's technology. You know, we recognize when we set up the incubator, that technology is a core component of the law firm, even when you're in your infancy, even when you're just starting out. So I need you to understand that this is, it, it's not something that's optional. It's something that is mandatory. Not that I'm making it mandatory. I don't set the rules. Nobody made me the mayor of the law firms, but I can tell you that if you want to be relevant in the marketplace, if you want to create a good client experience, if you want to be able to charge the rates that you like to charge and actually make money on them, then you need to 
embrace technology in a way that it's going to move your firm forward, create a good client experience, have happy employees, not frustrated employees who are trying to like fight with the technology to get it to do what they want it to do. And that's going to come with time, but it's going to start with a mindset shift for you on where you place the importance of, of technology, learning it, getting, you know, wrapping your head around it, getting the knowledge and disseminating that in your firm. And I love that you came on here, Hainan, and got this conversation started for us. I am looking forward to the opportunity for future conversations that I'm sure we can have together. So um, once again, thank you so much for being here. Amen. And uh, folks, um, there you have it. Another great interview in the books. Well, folks, there you have it. A wonderful, amazing interview. Love Hainan. Love what he's about. Love his message. I definitely encourage you to check his book out. And uh, I'm going to be doing that myself. Uh, but before you go, I uh, don't know if you listened to episode 92 past Tuesday, where I talked about a workshop that we have coming up May 11th, Monday, May 11th. This workshop is amazing. If you are uh, struggling to figure out how to bring in clients on demand, how to uh, predict your sales, how to make sure that when somebody walks through your door, they're ready to become a client of your law firm. Uh, you definitely want to, first of all, check that episode out, but you also want to join us for a full day virtual summit where we're going to be doing hands-on implementation of that system. So if you want to walk away after spending eight hours with us and a number of our professional guest speakers, um, actually spending implementation time with us, walk away with a completed system ready to rock and roll, then you definitely want to join us May 11th. So mark your calendars and then go to profitwithlaw.com forward slash waitlist, profitwithlaw.com forward slash waitlist to get on the waitlist for this. It's going to be opening up shortly, if not already, by the time you're listening to this. Uh, we just want to make sure we have a place for you to go and express your interest in the event. Uh, if it's already open, this URL will forward and redirect to the page where you can register for the event itself. So profitwithlaw.com forward slash waitlist. We will see you there. Take care. That's it for this week's episode of Profit With Law. If you have enjoyed the show, please consider sharing it with at least one person. Imagine how many lives we can change if we each shared this episode. Another way to share the episode is on social media. We appreciate your support and look forward to you joining us again next week.